Okay, so welcome to our Edible Gardens, Growing Herbs Through the Winter Talk. Thank you for joining us. So herbs, they grow great in the spring. I mean, almost everything grows great in the spring and um, the herbs will do really well. So you can plant them in the spring and um, they will grow through the spring. They're always happy in the spring. They'll grow pretty well in the summer. A big challenge that we have in the Inland Empire is the heat that we have. And so for those of you in coastal regions or farther up north, you don't have that issue. Um, and so um, you don't have the blazing sun drying out your herbs. So um, for us in the Inland Empire and the high desert, we definitely need to be careful about growing herbs in the summer and making sure that they have enough water and making sure that they're not, um, if uh, it's really, really hot, they're provided some shade um, if they're not, uh, if they need it. Most herbs are pretty tough. Um, they'll grow pretty well in the fall. You know, a lot of times in Southern California here, we have long dry summers. And so as you're going up into October and November, your summertime herbs or your warm season herbs will still be growing strong. You just need to make sure you're providing them with the right amount of water. Um, checking the soil before you water because as the days get shorter, um, plants don't photosynthesize quite as much. And even if it's warm, um, they need a little bit less water. But we have long dry summers, as you know. So keeping them watered is important. Um, and then they can grow in the winter too. So that's our topic today. So um, herbs are basically any plant with leaves, seeds, flowers that are used for flavoring foods, medicine, or perfume. Um, and because of that, you're dealing with lots of different plant families. So while we tend to group herbs together, um, as, uh, you know, by, by flavor or, you know, we, we grow, we group herbs together, but really botanically, there's a lot of differences. And so you have several plant families. I didn't dive into the plant families for today's talk. And that's uh, the slides. I want to add a couple photos and add that about the common families. Um, but there are many, many families, um, and like the banana is the world's largest herb. So it's a seed bearing plant that doesn't have a woody stem and dies to the ground after flowering. So herbs is a big broad topic and so I'm just going to sort of discuss the ones that we commonly grow and the kind of general best practices. Um, and then we have herbs and spices and usually spices tend to be stronger in flavor. Um, so you have your culinary herbs or your plants that are usually they're fresh or dried um, leaves to enhance flavor um, or flowers. And then spices are often seeds, fruits, bark, roots, um, and uh, they're harvested um, from different species. So that's why I say when you think about herbs and spices, it's, it's lots of different things. And some of them are annuals, meaning they live only one season and you replant them every year. The perennials live for many years and um, some of those go dormant in the winter. Um, and then you have shrubs. Um, those are the woody parts, um, uh, woody plants that live for many years. You also have plants that are biennial and those plants take two seasons to reach full maturity. Um, so some of the more common herbs for our warm season are gonna be basil, chamomile, chives, cilantro, dill, mint, oregano, parsley, rosemary, sage, stevia, tarragon, sweet marjoram and thyme. And then you can see your cool season herbs are kind of a short list, um, but there's a lot more to it than that. Um, some of, uh, we'll talk, divide this up another way into annual and perennial plants. And so um, there's lots of things that you can grow in the winter. And then many of the um, herb flowers are also um, edible. Oh, I see, there's a typo here, sorry about that. Um, and so in addition to um, herb flowers being edible to us, and there's also some things like nasturtiums, which are edible flowers that are, you know, I don't think people would consider nasturtiums necessarily herbs, but they are herbaceous in growth and they're very spicy and they add lots of flavor um, to your, some people eat the leaves, some people eat the seeds. You can make capers out of nasturtium seeds and some people um, eat the flowers. But the herb flowers are also um, great for pollinators. And so we do a lot of presentations about 
uh, pol growing pollinator gardens. Um, but as I got more involved in seed saving, um, then you let a lot of plants that you wouldn't always let go to flower, go to flower. And I realized that so many things in your vegetable garden and your herb garden really can be pollinator plants. Another thing that was really eye-opening to me was, um, it's a website, what is it called? California Butterflies. I'll have to look it up. I can include it in the resource sheet. But they talk about um, food sources for butterflies and um, for nectar and also for their uh, larvae. And herbs just comes up or come up again and again and again as a food source uh, for uh, both adult and juvenile pollinators, the butterflies and moths. So I've turned, instead of really focusing on like a pollinator garden, I allow my herbs to grow to flower um, when it's time because it does reduce the leaf production. When your plants go to flower, they go from the growth part of their life stage to the reproductive part of their life stage and they focus on that so the leaves get smaller. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and if you are going to be saving seeds, then you need to grow the flowers anyway. So usually what I do in the herb garden is I let some of my, I plant extra and I let some of them go to flower. And um, usually the flowering is triggered by, by the temperature and the length of the day and the type of plant. So letting a couple of your plants go to flower, I don't think impacts the other ones um, going to flower. And you just keep pinching back the, because they're always trying to flower. That's their ultimate goal. Um, and so when you pinch back the flowers, it puts all of the attention back into the plant. Now, I wanna say that this is, um, this is true for your annual plants, for your perennial plants, then the growth cycle is a little bit different. And so in thinking what makes an herb a warm or cool season, when you look at that list that I showed you uh, a couple here, um, a lot of these, uh, ones on the warm season side will grow quite well in our winters. You know, one thing Southern California, unless you're up in the mountains, um, you know, has very mild winters often. Um, the Inland Empire more warm than the high desert, but we have really mild winters. And so a lot of these ones that are um, warm season can last through Christmas and right into January. Um, in January and February, the coldest time of the year, most of our warm season characters sort of give up. And so some of the warm season herbs are plants that will tolerate some heat without uh, bolting. And we'll talk about bolting and that's where it goes to flower. But they're plants that will tolerate some heat without going to flower right away. Um, and they may be plants that do better with longer days. Again, we're talking about plants from many different families. So when we're making generalizations about how herbs grow, um, you know, they don't all fit in the same category, um, but you'll start to know for your yard, the characters that do well um, and, and get to know. I, last year, last year was my year of herbs and I, I made it my focus, um, to just introduce more herbs into my yard. And I had um, lots of pollinators come visit. I learned a lot. So if you're interested in herbs and consider dedicating a year to herbs, this year it's going to be vegetables. Um, and uh, so I'm going to focus on uh, cool season uh, vegetables this spring and really focus on expanding that in my yard. Um, but most of the thing that makes something a warm season versus a cool season are plants that really aren't going to tolerate the uh, cold temperatures. So if, if we didn't get cold, basil, um, it will go to flower, but I have basil that's several years old. I found a way to sort of over now it doesn't look like super great but it, it's largely our temperatures our cold temperatures in January and February and the short days and um, just this kind of like a slow growing period for your herbs um, but they most of them could probably grow year round if the conditions were right so and for several seasons you know they're not going to last forever but I do have a three-year-old basil right now that's just kind of Keeps, um, you know, it's not producing a lot of leaves. It's more of a science. It's more of a science project at this point, but it kept going. So really, what makes something a warm or cool season is that it can tolerate um, cold. And 
or or the um, in the reverse case, um, or that it can't tolerate the cold. So uh, what the things that we have trouble growing right now are the things that just aren't going to tolerate the cold. And um, so your cool season annual herbs, you can plant them August to September in the coastal areas for a fall crop. If you're planting them from seed um, in the Inland Empire or the high desert, August to September might work, um, but um, it can be a little bit hot. You're gonna have to provide them. So probably for the high desert or a hot summer, we would be wanting to plant from seed our cool season herbs in like September or October. And if we were doing transplants, we would be planting them anytime between um, like mid to late September, depending on how hot it is to all the way up through December. You'll notice that it says for cool season annual herbs um, and the annual plants are ones that are alive for one season. Um, then it's saying you have like a fall crop and a spring crop, um, but not really even for the cool season herbs, not having them uh, annual herbs, not having them grow through the coldest time of the year. So when you are growing herbs in January and February, then um, you really need to be mindful that they're not getting overwatered, which we'll talk about, and protecting them from frost. A lot of these cool season annual herbs will dry out in the summer. And um, it, we'll talk in just a moment about growing them in like a sunny spot, but that's how you get them to do well um, through the winter. Um, and um, we already talked about letting them bloom to attract beneficial insects and sow the seeds um, in the and, and to um, have them self seed if you like, but you have to be careful with that. We'll talk about invasives in just a minute. So again, for your cool season annual herbs, it's like March to April and September is the kind of window. Um, I think you can go, you know, if you're planting from seed and you haven't started your plants yet, then you might want to wait through February um, just in case we get some really cold weather or plan on planting them in like a cold frame, um, which is like a little tiny greenhouse or a greenhouse. I have a few other slides at the end which have some suggestions about how you can keep them warm. For next year, your best luck in January and February with herbs um, during this coldest time of the year. And on the coastal areas, you guys don't get quite as cold, I don't think. So you guys don't have that issue as much. But what you want to have is you want to have mature established plants that are going in January and February. That will be their best chance to overwinter during that harshest period. So right now we're on like the third week or whatever of January and um, planting seeds right now that may be three or four inches tall in February. Um, just make sure you're mindful of them needing frost protection or you wait until like the end or mid part of February to get those seeds started. And then for your warm season um, herbs, you can start those uh, mid-April through August and any seeds that you start in the Inland Empire or High Desert from June to August will definitely need some protection from the sun. Um, your perennial herbs, um, many of them will live for several years. I have one, a rosemary that's been alive my entire life, so it's got to be 30 or 40 years old. Um, and um, most of those perennial herbs are going to be sensitive to overwatering. Um, they're usually purchased as, um, I apologize, there's a lot of typos on here. I am not feeling well. I just got COVID tested today and my brain is not like fully functional. I know it's in there, um, but it's not fully functional. I see a lot of typos in here. Um, so those are typically purchased as um, uh, potted plants, not as seeds. Um, they can also do well from cuttings. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. I um, mean, the best time to plant these um, Perennial herbs is usually in the spring or the fall. So March through May and um, September through November. So the spring and the fall are the best times. You can plant them in the summer and you just have to, again, protect them from the heat um, by providing some shade cloth, making sure that they're well watered. 
I mean, you can plant them in the winter too. I planted several herbs in the last uh, couple of weeks right before we had that cold weather and they're doing fine. I just um, kept them under the shade of a tree, which sort of buffers them a little bit from cold weather. And perennial herbs require little to no fertilizer and usually don't do well with mulch. So here's a list um, from our master gardeners in Santa Clara um, of annual and biennial herbs and perennial herbs. And you can see, so like basil is one that's definitely gonna like the summer. Dill, parsley, fenugreek, um, fennel, uh, cilantro, and uh, the other ones here, uh, chamomile, I've grown all of those. Um, chia I have not and chervil I have not. But those all will do best with um, being grown in the summertime or if you're trying to overwinter them, then they're gonna need a lot of extra effort. So these are the ones that I kind of look at as the warm season characters. The basil will do really well in the heat in Southern California and you can find a lot of heat tolerant um, varieties of basil. Um, dill and fennel will do really well in the summer. I cannot grow cilantro to save my life. If my life depended on it, it would be in trouble because cilantro, I have such a hard time growing. And then other people just have it take off. And I suspect my problem with cilantro is I'm inconsistent about watering. And cilantro does struggle if it's too hot or too cold. You'll notice that most of these um, plants are, um, they don't have like a woody stem, they're very soft and they are sensitive um, to periods of uh, really cold and um, with exception of cilantro, most of these do very well in the heat. And cilantro, if you've got the secret, you know, feel free to type it in the chat because, uh, but the, in theory, <laughs> if it, it does grow, I've seen it grow and it grows well in the spring and fall. And if it's established in the summertime and you can kind of keep it partially shaded, um, it seems to do best. It doesn't hold up to the heat like basil just sort of goes crazy. In the heat. And then you have all these perennial herbs and you'll see these are from all different families um, and all different types of plants, you know, bay laurel and a tree and then you have chives, chives. Um, those I have and, and I plant them once and they grow year round. Same with green onions and you've got curry leaf, fennel, fennel, we'll talk about invasive plants later. Ginger, you've got a tuber there. Is it a tuber? I think, it, I don't think it's a modified stem. Either a tuber or a modified stem. And then you have lavender, lavage, lemongrass can become very invasive, marjoram and mint, oregano, rosemary, saffron and sage, sorrel, tarragon, thyme, turmeric, and Chinese, uh, sorry, Vietnamese coriander. And um, these are, um, the ones that are, are usually once established, pretty hardy to be very successful year round in the Inland Empire and the high desert. Many of these will do well, maybe just being protected from that really hot weather or the really cold weather. And then if you're on the coast, I think your biggest issue on the coast is diseases like uh, that are mildew or uh, moisture related would be my guess. Um, but so basil, for the winter time, um, I have basil and it just, when we had that cold weather, it just finally died back. Um, so I was growing basil through January or through at the end of December. Um, and I will replant it again, probably the end of February where I am in the Inland Empire. Same with the other sensitive ones. My parsley is growing great, really, really great. So the parsley is a good one to uh, grow uh, year round. Your Mediterranean herbs, um, they're often uh, drought tolerant um, and they're some of the most popular ones are rosemary, sage, thyme, and oregano. And they definitely need um, excellent drainage and require full sun. And um, yeah, the if you irrigate, like over irrigating um, often leads to um, diseases and most of these plants don't, most of the Mediterranean plants don't seem to need any fertilizer in my experience. If you have um, experience with needing to fertilize your Mediterranean herbs, uh, feel free to share in the chat. Um, but I do not fertilize any of mine and most of our master gardeners do not. And the general rule of thumb seems to be that they don't need um, fertilizer. Um, and they will have some dieback in the hot times of the year. 
usually what I do is I wait till it starts to regrow and then anything that doesn't sprout out again, I'll cut back. And, um, or, and a lot of times I just give it a haircut. I'll share these in the chat at the end. And um, I thought these were two really cool lists of herbs because they were covered some herbs I hadn't heard of before. So feel free to check those out and um, uh, see what other kind of herbs you haven't heard of. Um, and yeah, Belinda, cilantro. I don't know what's up with cilantro. You're not alone. So when you select your herbs, pick what you like and try something new. That's what I do. When I go, there's, there is a window, okay? Like I'm not, when you go to garden centers, you know, whatever garden center is local to you, there is a very short window that people like me, and there's hundreds of us are out there waiting for, where your nursery will have, instead of two kinds of mint, they will have, not joking, like 10 to 15 kinds of mint, you know, eight to 12 kinds of basil, like so many, you know, the, the selection will go from like 15 varieties to maybe 45 varieties. It's crazy. And it only lasts for a really short window. So, and it's usually in the spring is when it happens. And they really buy, when I've talked to garden centers, at least in Southern California, that's the time of the year when they purchase and everything else just kind of straggles in. Um, I did notice last year with, the, with COVID and people being more interested in gardening, they did have like a big purchase that they did in the fall of a lot of varieties. And maybe that had to do with the growers. I don't know what that was about, but start checking your garden centers. Like down here, I wanna say maybe like late February, early March, and maybe go like, you know, put your wallet, leave your wallet in your car and uh, go uh, like uh, once a week or something, just keep an eye out for those. Is there, it's about a one and a half week window where they have so many different kinds. And I just, I kind of go by plant. So sometimes I buy all the mint that they have and I try different mints. And some of the mints, it's so funny, like the mint is defined by a, are characterized by a square stem. There's lots of different kinds of mint, but some of the mint is really hardy and some of it is not hardy at all. And so I've really found it so fun to like one year I grew like seven different kinds of basil. And it was so interesting to see how some of them did really well in my yard and some of them didn't do well at all. And they were all next to each other. So try new things. Um, you want to um, also be mindful if something is invasive. And I listed a few of the invasive properties, but some of these herbs are really invasive. And so I have a short list of some that are particularly invasive. And then you wanna to think too, is it an annual? Is it a biennial? Is it a perennial? Um, because you might want to plant something else in that pot at another season, or you might wanna use, I use herbs a lot of times, what I call for like foundational plants where in between seasons in my garden where it's not cool season and it's not warm season, the herbs are the only thing really thriving and growing. Um, and so I use them for foundational plants, but you have to place them carefully. We work with a lot of school gardens um, in the Master Gardener program. And I can't tell you how many schools I've been to where a rosemary or a lavender has been planted with the other herbs and the vegetables. And you know, after a couple of years, takes over and, and takes over the whole bed and they don't want to pull it out. So just consider where you're planting it and what type of plants it is. And then there's a couple of really cool seed catalogs, uh, just to name a few, not endorsing them as a master gardeners, but you have the Plant Good Seed Company, um, you have um, Native Seed Search, you've got Territorial Seeds, uh, Baker Creek Seeds, and um, if you guys want to drop any other favorites in the chat, feel free. I remember there's one and they had mints and they had like 45 different kinds of mints. And I was like, yeah, so hold on to your wallets. <laughs> but there's so many fun herbs to grow. So just try different things. Um, and um, you can plant them from seeds or from cuttings or transplants. Um, some do better from like lavender does best from uh, cuttings. Um, some of them do better from seeds, um, but if you have any questions about a particular, I have a few slides plus the, some of the websites that I'm going to share um, have some more information and, and feel free to ask questions at the end, um, which do better from what, but you kind of have to just play around with it. Seeds are, um, 
I do a lot of herbs from cuttings. And usually if they're kind of a woody stem, one of the sites that I'll share is, talks about hardwood herbs and softwood herbs and herbaceous herbs and how to propagate them. Um, and the herbs do really well in the ground and pots. You can put them in upcycle containers. They need to be planted in full sun and they need to be planted in soil that's well draining. So if you, you know, a lot of times they advertise like herbs in your windowsill and unless you have a south facing window that gets good sun, um, your plant will grow but it's not gonna give you like, you'll get a basil, but you're not gonna get enough basil to grow pesto. So you definitely wanna make sure that they're getting uh, full sun. And uh, the perennial herbs do really well in sandy soil. The herbaceous herbs, the sort of softer herbs um, prefer soil with uh, rich in organic matter and they all want a well draining soil. So the time to, we talked about this a couple of times and I feel like I'm giving you different times, but it really depends on the, um, the season. So for most of your cool season herbs to be thriving, like the herbs that I have that are thriving right now through the winter, which is what our talk is about, are herbs that I planted in the fall. Um, again, they had time to establish and they're you know, more than eight or 10 inches tall by the time we get that cold weather. It makes them a little bit more hardy to that cold weather. The basil is the only exception where um, I have yet to see really good basils, unless you're on like a south facing side and it's close to the house, they usually won't thrive. Um, but feel free to, every year is different. Um, and uh, if you can afford to, or you have seeds, or you want to try cuttings, I did a bunch of rosemary cuttings right before the cold weather and the rain, and they loved it. And I even had some lavender that I had in a bag from a workshop, and in the cold weather and the rain, they survived in the bag for three and a half weeks, which is like remarkable. So just because it's winter time doesn't mean you shouldn't try with these herbs. At the end, I'd like to take questions about particular challenges you have with growing herbs in the winter to see if there's other things that I haven't covered. But for next year, when you want herbs through the winter, I encourage you to plant them in about November, probably November or December. And if you wanna plant right now, give it a try. We might have a warm spring or a warm winter and they might do quite well, or you just give them a little frost protection. Um, never wanna transplant transplants deeper than their current soil level. So if you are doing transplants, those are plants that are um, you know, already established in soil. You wanna plant them at the same depth, not deeper. And things like lavender are very susceptible to crown rot, right where the plant meets the soil. That's usually what kills lavender, is them um, being too moist in that area. You definitely don't wanna plant them too deep. If you are planting things like basil, then um, be careful about starting them right now. If we do have a long, cool spring, then they may get too long before you can take them outside. But I just saw today on social media, um, a person was posting about growing black basil in their basement in the winter time, and it was pretty spectacular looking. So these herbs, it really is about how much effort you wanna go to protect them from the elements, um, from the moisture, and the cool and the short days, but you can pretty much grow anything. The young plants in, this, in the winter time, um, so it says young plants may need shade while establishing or the weather is hot in the winter time, they may need frost protection um, or being placed if they're in pots, you could place them next to the house. I think I have, I have that in another slide, placing them next to the house or placing them under the canopy of a tree will help keep them from being too cold. And usually the coldest weather we have is like after it's been cloudy or rainy and then this, the sky clears up because that those clouds kind of hold the moisture in or the heat in. And so when it's really a clear night, those are our really cold nights. If your soil has too much clay or sand, um, then it can be amended with compost, but sandy is better than clay any day when it comes to almost all your herbs. But the herby ones, the herbaceous ones, the ones that are not woody, they do like um, some compost added. And not necessarily needing too much fertilizer, but compost. And transplants are recommended for areas where you have a short growing season. 
and the seeds can be start, started later in the winter um, when you have longer growing seasons. So we could start in the Inland Empire. We could start seeds for herbs anytime between like mid-February. Some people start now and if we get, you know, as long as the spring is warm, they're okay. But I like to go early to mid-February through about May. After about May, they need a lot of support. So and if you are uh, doing transplants and you want to break up these uh, root bound, uh, the, the, the root bound roots, that's not the right word, but I think you know what I'm trying to say. You want to break up these roots, don't be afraid of your plants. Um, I already said most of the herbs need full sun. And I just want to make sure I emphasize that, that um, the more sun your herbs get, and this is a part I realized then, the more, uh, but it is awfully pretty. The more sun your herbs get, the more plant, uh, leaves and uh, vegetative growth and the stuff that we're probably looking to harvest, there will be. Um, so if you have heavy soil or shady yards, then um, I encourage you to try them in containers. I grow most of my herbs in containers of different sizes. And um, again, six to eight hours, the less sun also equals less flavor. Uh, shade grown herbs have more disease problems. And that's one of the issues that we face in the winter time is that, and for people on the coast, this is probably an issue when you have a lot of foggy mornings as well. So it really is gonna come down to, um, it says no standing water after rainfall, but I think when you're dealing with those uh, cool days or rainy days, or you're in a coastal area, making sure your pots are well draining, making sure that they are not too heavy and that they're um, maybe perhaps a little bit of sandy, like a little bit sandy with some organic matter mixed in and that you are um, uh, making sure that, I lost my train of thought there. Uh, oh, and it's just trying to keep them, um, trying to manage the, the water. You can't control how much humidity there is around your plant unless you wanna grow indoors, in which case, you know, for herbs, you usually need to have grow lights to have a, a good harvest. Um, but so you can't control the atmospheric moisture, but you wanna make sure you're not overwatering. That's what I was gonna say. Make sure you check the soil before you water. And that will help minimize uh, cool season issues with your herbs. Usually in a pot um, about eight inches deep is best. Um, clay works really well, but there's also wood pots and plastic pots that work really well. Um, you wanna be thinking about the different materials that your pots are made out of. Um, <laughs> and, you know, a glazed pot that's ceramic will take a different amount of water and, and hold a different amount of heat than um, your, porous clay, your porous clay pots, for example. So like in a cooler area, you might want that pot that's gonna hold a lot of heat, but if you're in the Inland Empire, you, you have to be mindful that that pot is gonna get very hot. And so like I have a lot of, I have on my porch glazed pots, unglazed pots, plastic pots and wood pots, and they all need have different water needs. So always just stick your finger in the soil for water. That's the biggest impact that the container material has on your herbs is how often you need to water and a little bit also how much radiating heat there's gonna be. Like a black pot is gonna be hotter than a brown or light colored pot. Uh, somebody asked in the chat thoughts on companion planting with tomatoes. Um, you know, as master gardeners, we try to share peer reviewed research. So from a peer reviewed research perspective, um, most of what I've come across is that the, the benefits of companion planting need to be more mechanical than sort of plants liking other plants. So are they two plants that are growing together that utilize like a different root zone? So for example, um, if you have tomatoes have, uh, you know, they can grow roots up to four feet deep, so deep. Um, and so if you had, you know, little basils, for example, growing around tomatoes, they're utilizing a different root zone than your tomatoes. So that could be a beneficial relationship. Another thing you would have to be mindful of is how much nutrients are these plants taking and where are the plants taking those nutrients? So if a basil has roots that are four to six inches deep, um, they're taking the nutrients from this zone 
And the tomato might be taking nutrients either from this entire zone or depending on where their feeder roots are. So they, they may be possibly competing for nutrients. Um, so you wanna think about sort of the mechanics of their relationship. Is one going to shade out the other? Can you use that shading as a benefit? I know a lot of people in the Inland Empire will grow lettuce um, under the canopy of say like a squash plant because the squash plant has the big leaves and provides that shade. So I really like uh, companion planting when it comes to sort of mechanical benefits like the utilization of root zones. Um, are they competing for nutrients is something to think about. Can one provide benefits like shading the other in a positive way? Will one shade the other? A tomato can be quite bushy and outshade a basil. Um, and then you have the ideas of companion planting that have to do with uh, pest management. And there's um, a lot of people that swear that plants either deter or encourage, uh, either they keep pests away from the garden, uh, like marigolds repel certain types of pests or that like people use nasturtiums as what they call like a trap crop so that the aphids will all go to nasturtiums. But you just need to be careful and, and kind of experiment in your own garden. And I'm not really giving you like a concrete answer because science doesn't seem to back up exactly like this, like a marigold is gonna keep this pest out of your garden. But there are, for example, like alyssum brings surfid flies into the yard and surfid flies are great for managing aphids. Um, but trap crops like the nasturtium where you're attracting aphids, you know, at some point in time, that trap crop becomes a farm for your aphids. So, you know, I think you kind of need to, I think what happens, I'm, I'm a big believer in permaculture and I'm a bl big believer in peer reviewed research and, and they sort of intersect at, in various ways. And the nice thing about what we do in our own yards is you know, it's good to follow peer reviewed research and it's really important to make choices that are environmentally friendly, um, but we can just try things out and see, you know, so for companion planting, um, companion plant with caution um, and be careful of things like trap crops, things like tomato, like tomatoes, like basil. That's, that's one that you hear. I think it's that we like tomatoes and basil. Um, and some people swear by it, but they're two plants that need a lot of sun. They need evenly moist soil. They do well with um, a soil that's rich in organic matter. And as long as that tomato is getting enough food um, and has enough calcium, then it will cooperate well with basil. So those are my thoughts on companion planting. Um, and, um, you know, again, to like a plant that's repellent, for example, you know, is it just repelling the pests to your vegetables? And those then become the most appealing plants in your yard. Um, so you just have to think about it. That, that's my two cents. And if anybody wants to add anything else, there's some really interesting information on companion planting. And I, and I really encourage you to give it a try and be a, a home scientist, a citizen scientist, and, and make observations and see what does work and what doesn't work. And it's funny, the more I try stuff, sometimes what I think makes something work well together, after doing it for a couple of years, I realize it's something else that I'm doing. Like basil gets wilted really fast if it doesn't have water. So for me, when I grow basil next to tomatoes, I think it's actually because the basil helps me remember to water the tomatoes more than anything else. Um, so just, just try things out and see what works for you. And that, those are my thoughts there on companion planting. Um, if you do have pots and containers, it is easier to manage one crop per container. Um, a lot of uh, herbs, uh, you know, very different families and have different watering needs. Um, it's easier when you're replanting annuals. So that's something to think about. Um, and some of the herbs want to dry out. Some of them want to be a little bit moist. So having one crop per container makes that management easier. Um, if you want to do a, a little bit of fertilizer with your herbs, then having run one crop per container um, also or per area also works. So planting 
I, I've tried planting a plethora of herbs in one wine barrel, like half a wine barrel. And so like 10 different types of herbs in a half a wine barrel. And I had pretty poor success because really the plants had different needs. I didn't fertilize any of them, but they had different needs. So this year I did a whole, or last year I did a whole wine barrel of thyme and a whole wine barrel of basil and a whole wine barrel of parsley. Way more successful because I could not water some, water some other ones. Um, and it really came down to the watering and a little bit the shade. I had the parsley a little bit more in the shade. So I encourage you to um, separate, if you are doing a container, separate them by crops. They'll do well in raised beds. They really like, they'll, they'll do well in these cute upcycled containers. And I have a few photos to show you in just a minute and I'll have my little comments about them. Um, but the more soil, the more um, plant material you'll get. And the thing with herbs is that like this uh, purple basil down here at the bottom or a purple basil, um, <clears throat> you know, it's super cute and it's already gone to flower and the leaves are probably just gonna get smaller and you're not gonna make pesto out of this, you know? And so it also, you need to ask yourself, um, what I did with my herbs last year is I started them in February or March and I grew them for Thanksgiving and I let them go to flower and um, I really just kind of let them be pollinator plants until I needed them um, this fall for cooking. Um, and uh, I had my best show of basil between November and December, so you never know. But when you're planting them, if you plant them in the cute little containers, you'll get little tiny plants like this, but not much use. So if you don't need a lot of leaves, that's okay. But if you want a big volume of leaves and you want to sort of, you know, go sort of industrial and, and really be able to harvest, then they're going to need a good amount of soil. Um, you want to make sure you take care of them like you would your other veggies and herbaceous plants. Watch for them drying out. The woody plants, like your Mediterranean plants, you want them to dry out a little bit between watering and your herbaceous or your softer plants, you wanna keep them evenly moist, but have them in well-draining soil. Fertilizer is up to you. You know, um, most of these herbs, the annual herbs, maybe they're only gonna grow for six or seven months. They really probably don't need that much fertilizer. If you wanna fertilize them, then you could fertilize them, you know, if maybe every, three or four months or no, no more often than every month. And for your Mediterranean plants, I wouldn't fertilize them at all. I don't fertilize any of my herbs and I get big crops, but if you'd like to, then maybe, um, you know, once at the end of the spring and maybe once at the end of the summer, but also be careful. You don't want to fertilize your dry or semi dormant plants. Um, so fertilize with caution, reach out to your master gardener program in your county in San Bernardino County. We have a helpline and we're happy to help answer those specific questions. Um, and so then the question was grow boxes. Um, are you thinking of, um, the like, uh, uh, cold frames like PVC on the ground, like kind of like a mini greenhouse? Are you talking about like marijuana growers like a uh, uh, mylar lined uh, big plastic tent. Uh, put more in the chat on that and then I'll uh, answer that question. Um, and so mulch if you want to, um, I wouldn't do it with rosemary or lavender. They do not like their soil level messed with. But for other herbs, you could mulch to keep water in and help keep weeds down. Um, so that's more of a personal aesthetic and I think fertilizer is kind of a personal aesthetic too. Um, we do wanna use less chemicals. So maybe if you're gonna, and also remember with the herbs too, that you're harvesting and eating those leaves. So you need to be very cautious about what you spray. And I kind of go toward the less chemicals, the better um, idea. Um, oh, more about self, about uh, self or controlled watering. All right, give me just I'm telling you, I, I mean, my brain is not all together there. Give me just a minute to ponder that question and let me go through a few more slides and then we'll get back to that, okay? Uh, sorry, I'm not, I'm not 100% today and I'm disappointed. This is one of my favorite topics. So hopefully what I've said, except for my typos has made sense. I love growing herbs. So bolting is something that I've mentioned in a few different ways, which is your plants going to flower. Um, 
And so the plants that do better in the cool season, so we talked at the very beginning about um, warm season and cool season herbs and that the warm season herbs are plants that usually just don't tolerate the cold weather. Um, but they will grow through, like if it didn't get cold, they would grow through the season. Um, eventually they would go to flower, but they can grow on for quite some time. And then for our cool season herbs, um, parsley is one that I can think of off the top of my head. Uh, cilantro is really sensitive to the heat. Those are plants that as soon as it gets warm, um, they tend to go to flower. Broccoli for vegetables, you've got your broccoli and cauliflower and cabbage. They'll go to flower right away um, if it gets too warm. And so if you're gonna harvest seeds, um, then bolting is not always a bad thing. It's a nectar source for your pollinator um, insects and even sometimes uh, birds and your um, other um, nectar loving animals. And so, um, you know, it's not always a bad thing, but I was taught when I was a kid to pinch back the flowers. And if, you, if your plant goes to flower and you wanna still harvest the leaves, then you wanna reach down the, the stem of the uh, flower, flowering stalk, it is a little bit different. So if you have all of your leaves down here, they have sort of like a different stem. For most of your herbs, it will send up kind of a thick stem and you wanna cut it back all the way down here at the base. Try to find the base of that thick stem and where it starts to have the more leafy areas. And that should encourage the plant to re-leaf again and put more energy into leafing. But usually once the plant has sort of gotten the signal that it's getting warm or that it's time to reproduce, it's just gonna send out another stalk and you're gonna keep cutting them back. So um, another way to deal with that is to do something called succession planting. So, um, you know, if you have 10 basils and it gets really hot, or you have cilantro and it goes to flower and you don't want it to go to flower or parsley and it goes to flower, then um, you know you can keep cutting back the flowers, but it's only gonna buy you a couple more weeks or a month. It's really not gonna buy you that much time. It's gonna keep sending out a flower stalk. So I just let it go to flower, but say you planted all your basil um, or your, say you planted your parsley you know, in November, and maybe consider planting some parsley at the end of December and maybe some parsley again in the beginning, uh, end of February or the beginning of March. And so that will also, because even though the plant bolts in response to temperature, then um, it also has to do with how old the plant is. So if you have a plant in, that you planted in November and it starts getting warm in February, that plant is definitely going to know like it's if it's an annual plant, it's gonna know it's, it's the season's almost over, it's time to go to flower. But the plant that you plant in February is not gonna to go to flower for you know probably at least eight to 10 weeks just because it needs to reach that maturity. So consider planting successively for both your warm and your cool season. Same with basil. If you plant basil in um, April and maybe some in May. And um, if you have a way to keep them from the heat or you live in a coastal area, maybe plant some basil in August and maybe basil again. I, my most successful basil this year, I planted in the end of September. And that was the biggest crop that I got because it wasn't, we had a really hot, dry summer. And so consider using succession planting to also help uh, prevent the bolting. And if they do bolt, consider letting them go to flowers because the pollinators love them. And so you can have an edible garden for you and an edible garden for the bugs too. Um, common pests can be seen are aphids, caterpillars. I've had uh, not too many problems with gophers, but I, I had a mouse that I think it's a mouse. So it could be a rat, I think it's a mouse. And I, I planted some and kind of like on the side of my driveway in some random spot. And it didn't touch any of them for like eight months. And then it got really hot and really dry. And first it ate my sage. All of It went through and ate all of the sage. Then the next it went through and ate all of the thyme. And then the next it went through and ate all of the mint. And then it went through last and ate all of the fennel. So it was kind of funny because you could tell 
what um, it liked and it didn't like. It was very selective. It could have also been a rabbit. Rabbits like my herbs. So for the uh, the vertebrate pests, um, it really is all about mechanical barriers. Oh, and somebody else put um, uh, white flies as another common pest. I didn't think about that one. Um, so white flies is another one you want to watch out for. Um, but so for your vertebrate pests, it's mechanical barriers. For gophers, it's planting in pots, putting in hardware cloth. For rodents, you, you just have to put physical barriers. You know, you may have luck with plant with like box urine or other random things, but science doesn't seem to indicate that those have um, really significant results. So it's mechanical barriers um, for those things. There's also diseases like powdery mildew. I want to share that our UCIPM page, our UC Integrated Pest Management page, which is our go-to for master gardeners. Um, if you go to their page and you search herbs, they, they have a lot of information about herbs and common pests. And I encourage you to go check this site out. Um, and if you don't like to do your own research or you don't have time or you have questions about your research, then reach out to our Master Gardener helpline and we can help you out. But our UCIPM page is the good go-to for your herb questions. And just always remember that caterpillars are like, here is this, you know, spray it with a BT or spinosad for your caterpillars and then it's picture, um, this is a fellow master gardener. This is a great presentation that they prepared and I love it because these are pictures of monarch butterfly larvae, which um, on a parsley. So it appears to be as far as I can tell, um, unless it's um, some sort of imposter caterpillar because um, it doesn't have the long antenna, I'm not quite sure. But just remember that all of the caterpillars, love them or hate them, they are gonna grow up into the pollinators you probably want in your yard. So just be mindful that everything you spray, you know, maybe you hand pick, um, and then just be careful with anything you're spraying. Uh, this lady in Los Angeles, um, Christy Will Wilhelmi, um, she's written a couple books and um, I've heard her speak before. And for her cabbage, um, which may be something you could do as well with your herbs if you're having trouble, when they were small, she covered them with like a floating row cover or a frost cloth type thing. So they got to be tall enough, I think it was like eight or so inches tall where they could survive, maybe a little bit bigger, like 10 inches, I can't remember, but where they were sort of, they had gone past the six inch size and they were kind of solid plants and they could stand up to caterpillars a little better. And then she uncovered them and she handpicked caterpillars. So just keep in mind all those caterpillars are future um, pollinators. The best time to harvest herbs is in the early morning um, or just before the blooms open. Uh, you want to, uh, for most herbs, you're usually going to harvest the leaves at the tip, back about two to three inches, or cutting back uh, just above the node. You can freeze them by rinsing and chopping them, uh, placing them in ice trays with water. You can also spread them on cookie sheets or store them in a freezer bag. So they'll lose their color a little bit, but they'll retain the flavor. Then you can air dry um, them, dehydrate them, or microwave them. Be careful in the microwave because they will like spontaneously combust. So I do not encourage you to do microwave unless you're living on the edge, but you could give it a try. You can dry herbs in the microwave. Um, for your seeds, I know we're a few minutes over, so I'm just wrapping up here. Um, for your seeds, um, herbs, are a really great place to start seed saving, especially basil, cilantro, dill, and fennel. Um, very easy to harvest the seeds, very easy to find the seeds. Mint seeds are so tiny, it's crazy. Um, and the seeds are pretty easy to start. But some herbs are really invasive and they'll spread really easily by seeds. Some of them spread by runners like the mint family, um, we're all pretty familiar that the mint plant family is invasive and that usually spreads by um, runners or roots. But parsley um, can be pretty invasive depending on the conditions in your yard. Bee balm is one I've had take off in my yard um, and, and pretty much cover where I used to have a lawn um, one season. Fennel, I think it was, um, is really invasive in the Channel or Santa Cruz Islands. They've had a really big problem with it. Dill is another one. Lemon balm, oregano and marjoram have self-seeded all over my yard. I love it because it's a ground cover, 
but just keep an eye on some of these ones. Um, and so these may be ones that you don't want to let go to seed. Um, especially if you live near like a wildland area, you probably need to be more careful about some of these ones like fennel, which can really take off in Southern California or in coastal areas. So let your herbs, let your herbs go to seed responsibly. And if you have questions about that, reach out to our Master Gardener program or your local program. When you're harvesting the seeds, you wanna allow them to mature on the plant and harvest um, when they're dry and mature and then store in a cool, dry place. If you wanna know more about um, harvesting cool season veggie seeds and herb seeds, tune into our talk that we'll do in uh, February. Um, and I'll put it on our calendar if it's not there already soon in the next couple of days. Really quickly, since we're over, I just wanna talk about one of my favorite things, which is the three-tiered herb garden. And the idea is three pots stacked on top of each other that are successively larger. Um, usually this bottom pot is like anywhere from 16 inches or 14 inches to two feet, going all the way up to this little pot, which can be four to 12 inches, depending on how big. And the thing I love about it is you have like different microclimates because you have the top, which is a drier area, and the bottom, which is a more damp area. And it also tends to keep moisture in the core because the pots are stacked. You get sort of like that, um, you know, cooling effect in the summer and you get sort of a warming effect in the winter and the moisture tends to stay. So what happens and you want these pots to have drainage holes. But what happens is the plant you pot in the, the plant you put in the top pot, uh, the roots often grow into the second pot and the plants you put in the second pot roots grow into the third pot. And I'm notorious for not remembering to water my plants. And I do really well with these. I also like the smaller ones because they're easy to move around if you get a hot spell or a cold spell. Um, and there's lots of different configurations you can do. So I'll just show you real quick. Uh, so here's a couple um, and uh, you'll find the, the, the Plants that do well in the top are things that like it a little bit drier, like sage or thyme. Um, rosemary does well in the top, but it's a really big plant. So if you are gonna plant it, plant it in the bottom. Rosemary and lavender don't really do that great in this setup, just because they're usually like large shrubs. But usually I can get about 10 to 15, um, or probably like eight to 12 uh, herbs in a stack, depending on how big the stack is. This one on the right-hand side uh, with my kiddos several years ago, it looks so sad, but I'm so impressed because this was sitting in my driveway for a solid month. I think it was in July or August with no extra water and um, it is still alive. And so I was able to water it and I want you to see this basil here. This is the science fair project, uh, three-year-old basil. So. You know, basil will overwinter, but it just gets too cold and it just kind of gets like this. But I grow basil on the second story and um, mint I put on the bottom because I can help control it in my yard. So I just love these. I want to point out for these kind of pots, like any of these things, super cute, but if there's no drainage, um, you're really, you have to be on point with your watering. Um, and I promise I'll wrap up in like the next couple of minutes but you really gotta be on point with your watering when it comes to these uh, pots with no drainage. Um, these ones are cute. Um, just imagine whatever's below that is probably gonna get kind of muddy. These are great. Some people are concerned about edibles in cinder blocks. So if that's something, uh, cinder blocks do give off um, some chemicals or leach some chemicals. So just think about that when you think about what you plant in cinder blocks. I usually plant ornaments up there. You can grow a lot of herbs, uh, a lot of plants in gutters and things like chives or onions or shallow rooted things will do okay. Lettuce does great, but a lot of the herbs are pretty deep rooted plants. Um, here's another example in the center of one that uh, probably these are pots set into something. They definitely need drainage holes. And then this one on the lower right with uh, it's like a shoe rack for a door, super cute but unless they are taking these out, watering them and letting them dry, just keep in mind that these are gonna look super funky. They're not gonna be all clean and white. Um, and not very much room for that herb to grow if you want to get a big harvest. Things that spill out like your um, uh, 
thyme or oregano, those can do well with a little bit less soil. But the bigger, if you want a big crop, they do need some soil to grow. So just to wrap up, and then I have a few slides that we can scan through while you ask questions, just to look at some pictures. Um, the special care for herbs in the winter is basically to protect them from some frost. Some of you guys are joining us from coastal areas and humidity is gonna be another issue for you that we don't really have to face very much in the Inland Empire. Um, the best way to avoid um, things that are um, waterborne pathogens, mildews and fungus is gonna be to prevent the water from sitting on the leaves. Um, but we can't, if it's foggy every morning, it is just a challenge, but you can go to our UC integrated pest management site or contact your master gardener helpline and they can give you some specific tips if you're having uh, mildews or fungus. Um, your woody plants are going to be pretty frost hardy, hardy. My lavender and rosemary do just fine and they're about to flower. One of the reasons I like them, your, your herbaceous or softer plants will be less hardy. And I think we covered it already, but your perennial herbs that will die back a little bit in the winter, let them start to leaf out. And when they start to leaf out, the parts that don't leaf out, you can uh, cut back or you can just trim them to shape them. And um, you can also keep them under eaves or next to tr under tree canopies or near structures to give them added warmth. Or if it's like this uh, three-tiered herb garden, um, like if I have some that are plastic, they're very easy to carry into the back porch if it gets cold. Um, you can also plant them on southwest facing areas to maximize your sunlight. And you also want to keep in mind some of your summer gardening spots might not get enough sun because the sun has gone so far south. So just keep that in mind and then just avoid the soggy soil. Make sure your pots are well draining. And if you have any kind of berm around your pot, uh, your plants in the ground, then breaking those berms and just watching or maybe in the future planting on a little bit of a raised mound so that they're not sitting in the uh, rain if you're in an area where that's a problem. So I'm just gonna go through, uh, we got basil, um, there's some cilantro, oregano, parsley, caraway, got rosemary, which is flowering. They, a great tree to have. It can be a really big tree. Fennel, wonderful, invasive. You got your mints, wonderful and invasive. Here's some different ideas for container gardening. Um, these are cute on the left, but maybe not quite enough soil, but they're still on the right. These look like they would have a lot more soil for herbs. Great way to get some little herbs going to start to plant in the ground or just to have a little bit of herbs for your cooking in the house. Um, keeping your mint in containers. I love this picture of the mint and look at these roots. They're like ready to take over the world. Um, garlic too and onions. We didn't talk too much about that. Lemongrass, just some different planting ideas. So check out our newsletter. It is on our website on the upper right hand corner. Um, you can sign up for that and you'll find out about like our pop up seed libraries, where we're going to be. Um, reach out to our Master Gardener helpline if you have any questions. Um, I thank you so much for joining us today. I am going to just uh, pop over to a different screen um, real quick. And I'm just gonna show you the integrated pest management site. And then um, go back to that question about box, uh, box gardens, which my brain still doesn't seem to be able to wrap itself around. So um, here is our, uh, let's see if I still have it up. Uh, so here is, yep, okay, so here is our UC integrated pest management site. And so like, for example, for um, rosemary, um, this has uh, cultural tips. And then here on the right hand side, you can see that it has common disorders and invertebrate pests, diseases. So it talks about how to manage phytophthora, root and crown rot. So remember, I told you that rosemary and lavender um, tend to be susceptible to that crown rot. So this is our go-to site. I'm going to put this whole thing in the chat um, and it will take you to the page and you can sort of navigate around in there 
or you can um, reach out to your local master gardener helpline. Um, and oh, great, thank you. Everybody said there, somebody said that they learned a lot. So that's great. I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording and I'm happy to stay on for 